Welcome, sadists, to my launch review of Intel's new flagship 13th gen CPU, the 24 core, 32 thread Core i9 13900K, which vexes me greatly in the best ways possible. You see, CPU reviews used to be much easier when it was just a blowout. Intel's CPUs for many years tromped all over AMDs, and then since about 2017, AMD has clawed their way back to relevance with several generations of Ryzen CPUs on the AM4 platform, eventually surpassing Intel in both gaming and computer compute performance by the time they got to the 5000 series. And then we thought it might flip-flop with AMD on top charging the premium prices, but Intel answered back in a satisfactory way with the debut of Alder Lake one year ago, and now we have a second lineup of CPUs that will also slot into LGA 1700 motherboards, either 600 series chipset boards with a BIOS update or the new 700 series options. We're only a few weeks out from AMD's AM5 debut too, so can Intel leapfrog the new Ryzen 7000 series CPUs with Raptor Lake? The answer is not easy. The answer is nuanced and multifaceted, so my job becomes more difficult. The upshot, though, is that you all can now benefit from my suffering as competition has yet again returned to the CPU marketplace. Hooray. Excellent! Thermal Take has done it. They've created a case fan with swappable fan blades, and it's called the Swafan. Available in 12 and 14 centimeter sizes, these high static pressure fans are ideal for use with radiators or dust filters, and they come with an extra set of reversed fan blades. Easy to replace and reverse your airflow, so now you can show off your fan's good side no matter where it's installed in your case. They use hydraulic bearings, feature three addressable LED rings, 2000 RPM max speed, and are, of course, very easy to clean. For more on the Swafan from Thermal Take, click the sponsor link in the video description. So I'd like to get straight into my test results, but I have three important notes to keep in mind if you're considering a new CPU or a new PC build entirely. First, the upgrade situation is now reversed. One year ago, AMD's AM4 socket was on the way out, and builders on that platform were warned not to expect upgrades in the future. Although there was the last Hurrah 5800X 3D back in April, which I am including in today's comparisons. But when it launched last year, Intel's LGA 1700 platform had the promise of Raptor Lake CPUs in the future, which are launching today. But Intel has made no promises for next gen. Based on past experience, I do not expect another generation of CPUs to come out for LGA 1700 motherboards, whereas AMD has promised to support the new AM5 platform through 2025 at the least. Secondly, both Intel and AMD have opted to embrace high CPU temperatures in exchange for maximum performance this generation. This is just a warning for the uninitiated or those with feeble constitutions. Things got a bit hot during testing this past week, but at least there were high scores to show for it. Thirdly, overall platform costs should be considered alongside the retail prices of these new CPUs, as early adopters who aren't already on an Alder Lake DDR5 setup will need a new motherboard and DDR5 memory kit if they want what's new and fresh. 13th gen CPUs do still support DDR4 memory Memory, but if you go with a DDR4 LGA 1700 motherboard, you'd need to change that out if you ever upgraded to DDR5. I only tested with DDR5 for today's video because the past four weeks have been a miserable hellscape of back-to-back-to-back-to-back high-profile hardware launches. The flow of time is immutable, and I'm barely clinging to sanity. But I do it all for you guys, so totally worth it. All that said, I have a bunch of benchmarks to share with you, or a bench of benchmarks if you like it better that way, and to save some time, I'll point out that all my test beds, comparison hardware, methodologies, and settings are the same as in my Ryzen 7600X and 7950X reviews, so please check those videos out for more details. I did manage to do a run of tests on the 7900X too, so that's included today as well. Here are my comparison CPUs for today. As you can see, the 13900K now has double the E-cores, 16 of them, giving it 32 threads total, just like the 7950X, albeit in a different core count configuration. P-core count remains the same, but we have higher clock speeds with 5.8 GHz max, and the DDR5 base standard is up to 5600 speed. There's also a bit more cache and a slightly higher max turbo power at 253 watts, but don't let those Intel specs fool you. There is much more than a 12 watt difference between the 13900K and the 12900K. The details of my test bed setup can be seen on screen now, but I will highlight a couple important parts. For the DDR5 platforms, I'm using two 32GB G-Skill memory kits, a Trident Z5 Neo kit with Expo settings for AM5, and their closest equivalent XMP settings kit for Intel, which is a Trident Z5 RGB kit. Both are rated for DDR5 6000 speed and CL30 timings. For the GPU, I'm using the MSI Supreme X version of NVIDIA's RTX 3080 Ti. And for the CPU cooler, we have a 360mm AIO 
Radio, the Corsair H150i Elite LCD. For our power supply, we have an overkill 1600 watt Corsair AX1600i, and the systems were set up in open test beds with the AIO radiator fans, pushing air across the motherboard CPU socket and VRMs for consistency. And now let's go over system performance. Here are the actual clock speeds each CPU was running at. I'm showing the peak frequency each CPU hit across all tests, as well as the sustained all core frequency during a 10 minute IDA 64 stress test. CPU temperatures are tied closely to this chart. So even though we can see the 13900K hitting its peak turbo speed of 5.8 gigahertz, the stress test resulted in temperatures as high as 100 degrees Celsius, at which point the 13900K throttles to stay within its operational range. And while the throttling is sporadic, typically dialing back the frequency by two to 5%, it peaked at 20% in the stress test. And as a result, the all core average is 5.45 gigahertz, not 5.5 as advertised. And even the E cores are at 4.29 instead of 4.3. Here are my temperature comparisons, showing the average core temperature after the 10 minute IDA64 burn-in test. And you'd like to think that a 360 millimeter AIO running at 90% fan speed could tame the heat a bit better, but at least AMD and Intel are now both in the same boat. So either it's a wash in terms of temperatures or we can criticize them equally. AMD's max temp for the 7000 series at 95C is lower than Intel's at 100, but the 13900K managed a lower average temperature, staying remarkably close to the 12900K. Note that Intel motherboards are quite inconsistent when it comes to power settings. The MSI Meg Z690 Unify I'm testing with does not limit the chip at all by default, but both Intel and AMD offer settings that can dial back both performance and resulting temperatures, such as the PBO undervolt method I used in my 7600X video. And perhaps it's worth looking into those lower power settings in a future video based on my power draw results. I'm showing three measurements, the typical wattage drawn by the entire system during the Blender open data render, the peak CPU package power draw as reported by Hardware Info, and the peak CPU package power draw while gaming, specifically with 3D Mark Times by Extreme. And here we see the most definitive win in today's video, which is that in terms of power draw and efficiency, AMD is still absolutely in the lead. Keep in mind that AMD is leveraging TSMC's five nanometer node, while Intel is still using Intel 7, which is actually 10 nanometer in terms of transistor density. For some, efficiency isn't much of a concern, but 100 watts more power draw versus the 7950X is nothing to sneeze at in my opinion. Also note the increase over the 12900K, which again, supposedly uses just 12 watts more on paper. And now it's time for the benchmarks, starting with Cinebench R23 to see the actual performance boost Intel has managed to squeeze out of the 13900K. AMD gained 10,000 points going from the 5950X to the 7950X, but Intel improved by 13,000 points, breaking 40K in the multi-threaded tests. That's about 4.8% faster than the 7950X and a 48% bump over the 12900K. And here are the single thread scores, an area Intel needs to remain competitive in, and they did, scoring 2,249 points with the 13900K. That's about 12.2% faster than the 12900K, and also 9.6% faster than the 5950X. CPU Mark is part of the Passmark Performance Test 10.2 suite and runs a series of synthetic workloads to determine overall performance. Multi-threaded scores leverage all the cores and threads available, but even with 32 threads available now, the 13900K couldn't beat the 7950X's score of 65,752 points. It was 4.4% slower than the Ryzen flagship, but it was also 40% faster than the 12900K and still more than double the performance of the 5800X 3D. In the CPU Mark single-threaded test, the 13900K again outperforms the 7950X, scoring 4,785 points to give it an 8.8% lead. It's also 10.8% in front of the 12900K here. Blender 3.3 is next, which is a free and open source 3D creation suite for modeling, animation, simulation, and rendering. The Open Data 3.1 test provides a samples per minute score across three test scenes, Monster, Junk Shop, and Classroom. The 7950X remained on top in this test with a score of 623, putting the 13900K about 4.7% behind, although it did stay 48% ahead of the 12900K. We have a couple entries from the Adobe suite next, starting with Photoshop, and I'm testing the 2022 version with the Puget Systems benchmark benchmark extension. Speaking of leapfrogging, the Ryzen 7000 series just finished toppling the 12900K in this test, but the 13900K has answered back. Its score of 1590 was 15% faster than the 12900K and a solid 4.7% improvement versus the 7950X. Here's Adobe Premiere Pro 2022 for the video editors out there, also testing with the Puget Systems benchmark extension. And this time the 7950X and the 13900K were neck and neck, scoring 1242 and 1245 respectively. That's 
that's essentially a wash, although both chips were more than 10% faster than the previous generation, which we like to see. Next, we have video transcoding via handbrake, processing a 150 megabit H.264 4K video down to 1080p with the fast preset. The encoding speed is shown as a frame rate, and the 13900K has set a new high watermark again at 71.8 frames rendered per second, finishing the transcode in less than two minutes, which was 7% faster than the 7950X and 24% faster than the 12900K. Moving on, we have V-Ray version 5.01, which is a software solution by Chaos Group that helps artists and designers create photoreal imagery and animations. Their benchmark is measured in V-samples, and here the 7950X's score of 29,611 allows it to stay on top of the 13900K, which was about 8% slower. Intel's new chip was 47.5% faster than the 12900K, though. The Corona Renderer is a modern, high-performance photorealistic renderer available standalone or as a plugin for 3D Studio Max or Cinema 4D, and we're looking at time to render, so lower is better here. The 13900K and 7950X are dead even, completing the render in 36 seconds on average, which is a whole 50% faster than the 12900K. The 6 and 8 core CPUs definitely struggle more in these raw render tests. Rounding out our compute tests, we have 7-Zip, testing basic file compression and decompression using the 32 megabyte dictionary size setting. The 7950X can't keep up with the 13900K in the compression test. Team Blue hit 175,528 million instructions per second, which is about 10% faster than the 7950X and 39% faster than the 12900K. For decompression, the Ryzen chips still dominate, and the 7950X's score of 263,970 MIPS remains untouchable. The 13900K notably improved by 53% versus the last-gen 12900K, but even the 5950X still managed to take second place. And now let's check out a batch of gaming benchmarks to see if the 13900K can take on the 7950X and or the 5800X 3D, which specializes in peak gaming performance and can still outrun the Ryzen 7000 series CPUs in some titles. I'm running all the games except 3D Mark at 1080p, a relatively lower resolution where CPU performance will make more of a difference in the frame rates we achieve. And for the GPU, we're running a factory overclocked MSI Supreme X variant of NVIDIA's RTX 3090 Ti. 3D Mark Times by Extreme is a synthetic benchmark from 3D Mark. It's a DirectX 12 test, and here the 3090 Ti's graphics score does not fluctuate much between CPUs, although the 13900K was able to eke out a few extra points. The CPU test is a better comparison, which is what the results are sorted by, and here the 13900K was 4% faster than the 7950X, and also 46% faster than the 12900K. Meanwhile, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is running in DirectX 12 mode, and here we have our first win from the 3D vCache-enabled 5800X3. 275.4 FPS makes it 2.5% faster than the 13900K, which pushed 268.5 frames per second, as well as double-digit 1% low improvements over the 12900K. Horizon Zero Dawn is next, using the Favor Quality preset and allowing the AMD chips to run away with multiple victories. The 7900X achieved an outright win at 219 FPS in this title, which clearly favors Team Red's CPUs, but this is why we need to test multiple games, since performance can vary between them. The most the 13900K can boast of here is a 13.4% win over the 12900K. Here's a look at Cyberpunk 2077, which has seen a resurgence in popularity recently. I'm using the Ultra preset, and I found these results exciting, because prior to now, most CPUs were hitting a wall at about 128 FPS in this test, with none getting over 130. But the 13900K jumped up to 149.3 FPS, about 16% ahead of the 12900K, and 18% in front of the 7950X. Civilization VI performance was tested with the Gathering Storm AI benchmark, where CPU capabilities are determined by AI turn time rather than how many frames it can squeeze out of a GPU. The 13900K manages to just barely stay ahead of the 7950X at 23.1 seconds versus 23.3, and here's an example of a test where the 5800X 3D does not have an inherent advantage thanks to the 3D vCache. Rounding things out with Far Cry 6, and here the 13900K manages a healthy win, coming in 17% ahead of the 7950X, 15% ahead of the 12900K, and even about a 12% win over the former champ in this test, the 5800X 3D. And now for the most popular part of my benchmark review videos where I summarize everything, even though people who skipped ahead to this part missed all that titillating violence and nudity during the individual test results. Here are my aggregate scores across all tests, starting with compute performance. 
I'm using the 12900K as the 100% baseline here to see how far Intel has come in a year. And based on these results, the 13900K is about 34% faster versus the 12900K. That's a big boost, but it's not without trade-offs as it comes with about a 20% increase to power draw in Blender as well. So even though it appears that the 13900K has matched the 7950X for compute tasks, if efficiency is at all a factor for you, then I think that gives the edge to the 7950X. Gaming performance is likely also important to you though, and that's why my job is so tough this time around. So let's take a look at those same values, just resorted by gaming performance. And here we can see Intel's gaming gains, 12.6% more performance versus the 12900K in the games I tested. But please note that gaming performance can vary a lot between titles and game engines. And I'm only including six today, so further testing is definitely warranted. Here's a final chart with current pricing as well because it helps to have it all on one page. I am using the retail prices for existing CPUs, not MSRP. And for the 13900K, I'm using the Newegg pre-sale price of $660. And this makes me happy because it's competitive with the 7950X, apparently offering more gaming performance and about the same compute performance for 40 bucks less. But if you look at the rest of the CPUs on this chart, and please note that there are some mid-range eight core chips missing for now, you might find that there's a chip that meets your needs for less than about $700 because not everyone has that kind of scratch. But here's where I come back around to why these CPUs are making my job hard. It would be easy and convenient if I could say, here you go guys, get this CPU, it's the best value and performance, no question but that would mean that there's no competition, and likely that wouldn't be the best for retail pricing in the long term. The actual situation is a lot less clear cut, and while I can confidently say that Intel has launched a really good CPU with the 13900K, and it does outperform the 7950X in gaming in my test suite while staying roughly equivalent in compute tasks, and it even costs a little bit less, I can't say this is the CPU that everyone should buy. For some who want the best and have the money, Yes, go ahead. For gamers though, there are quite a few other options for a lot less cash, especially if you're considering the 5800X 3D that now costs $400 and can run on DDR4 and cheaper 500 series motherboards. And speaking of 3D vCache, there are likely Ryzen 7000 3D series chips coming early in 2023. And if they boost gaming performance by 10 to 15% over the non-3D vCache chips like the 5800X 3D did, then my charts will likely need to be reshuffled yet again. But for now, Intel has an incredibly powerful new CPU in the 13900K, and although it's more power hungry than its predecessor, it has reasserted Intel's top dog position in the CPU market once again, but only by a modest margin. Okay, closing things to say, hit the thumbs up button, aka the like button on your way out if you enjoyed this video. You can also check out my store at paulshardware.net for shirts, mugs, other cool stuff you can buy, including my new 8-bit designs like this one. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and stay tuned for lots more content coming at you real soon. Thanks again for watching, guys, and we'll see you in the next video.